Welcome to Harnessing Your Wealth with Billy Peterson. As the founder and CEO of Peterson Wealth Services and a former number one ranked jockey, Billy knows what it takes to succeed. In this podcast, Billy and his team will help equine enthusiasts, business owners, and retirees understand the keys to financial freedom. Saddle up and get ready for a ride you won't soon forget on how you can harness your wealth. Hello once again, everybody. This is Billy Peterson. I'm your host of Harnessing Your Wealth. Today, I think we're going back into the wealth space. We have a great guest joining us today, Bob Kaner, Portfolio Manager at Hartford Schroeders. And Bob's job there at Hartford Schroeders is to manage the small and mid-cap strategies there at the company. And he's got a lot of insight into what's going on in the world of technology. And we want to bring his thoughts and his view, and along with those that he works around, including all the great minds at Hartford Schroeders, to share with you, our listeners, what's going on in the world of technology, all of this new buzz about artificial intelligence, how that's changing things, the new adaptions and new innovations that we're all going to be dealing with in our lives as, as things unfold in this technology. It kind of reminds me of the days back when the internet was just kind of getting underway and you had a lot of anticipation and new companies springing into life and there was there was a lot of buzz about it. There's going to be some winners. There's going to be some losers. And what we want to do is try to narrow it down and just talk about the industry in general and an outlook for the economy, maybe as a big bigger picture, what Bob and his associates are seeing at Hartford Schroeders. So with that said, Bob, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Also, just letting you know, listeners, that Sean's on board with us, too. He's regular. I'm lurking in the shadows. He's I'm back here. there just kind of waiting to see if we say the right things. And he's going to jump in when we get off course, probably. Maybe has some side cracks or two. But he's good for that. So let's just jump in, should we? Bob, will let's you go. Tell us, let's tell us a little bit about your background, Bob. Your education. Let's establish who you are and where you came from. And, and then a little bit about your role there at Hartford Schroeders. Sure. So um, from the Northeast, grew up in the New York area, uh, went to college in Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, which was quite a shock going from New York to Dallas in 1989. Studied finance and economics there. Uh, after there, I, I moved to San Francisco, which is interesting because I started working at a long only investment manager in San Francisco in 1994. And, and I was in San Francisco through 2004. So as you reference kind of that first internet bubble, I was definitely boots on the ground to see that um, explosion and implosion happen in a very short period of time. But I've do been doing small and mid-cap equity since 94. I think it's an am amazing place to kind of find alpha and um, really capitalize on that dynamism, if, if you will, of, of small and mid-cap stocks. And, and how long have you been with Schroeder? Sorry. Sure. I've been with Schroeder's 10 years. My responsibility is to manage the small and mid-cap equities business. Uh, I'm the portfolio manager for the Hartford Schroeder's small cap fund and the Hartford Schroeder's mid-cap fund as well. Fantastic. I'm sure you've got your work cut out for you. What are the sizes of those funds? Sure. Our small cap strategy in its entirety is about $2.4 billion. About, four or five, uh, about $600 million of that is with the Hartford Schroeder's. Uh, small cap fund. Um, our mid cap strategy is about $800 million. And then we have a SMID strategy that sits in between as well, which is about $4.2 billion. Total AUM approaching $8 billion. Cool. Nice. We like it. Asset under management, probably growing. People look in these directions right now because, of course, a lot of the, the buzz going on. So tell us about maybe big picture. What is your current outlook there at the firm and and what are you guys looking for in the markets over the near term sure so um when you say looking for what you're looking for in the markets i think it really depends what market you're looking at it's been a very narrow market this year uh in the u.s equity space i mean one of the the best kind of you know litmus test for that is looking at the market 
the return of the S&P versus the return of the equal weighted S&P. The spread really has never been so big unless you go back to that late 90s time period. I think S&P uh, is up mid to high teens and the equal weight S&P is up low single digits. So that gives you a sense of how concentrated the market is um, and really how much I think opportunity there is if you're willing to peel a couple layers of the onion back. I would say from an economic perspective, you know, U.S. resilience has certainly been kind of the, the message this year. If you think back at the beginning of the year, the, the consensus view was a recession in the U.S. was imminent. China was going to pull the world out of a, the, the global um, ditch, if you will, and Europe was going to turn the corner and come out of a recession as they had kind of less inflationary fuel pressures last winter. I'm pretty sure the exact opposites happened. <laughs> China hasn't delivered, Europe's turned south, and the U.S. has, has kind of maintained a resilient stance. So I think the outlook in the U.S. is pretty good. I think the consumer's challenged. Um, certainly, we've been waiting for savings, savings rates to deplete back down to pre-COVID levels. That seems to be kind of happening. Wage growth, real wage growth, no longer as positive as it was. I'd say an unwelcome kind of scenario is the rise in gas prices, especially on the low end consumer. You know, the juxtaposition there is that you have, you know, a, a significant amount of fiscal spending that we've all heard about for a couple of years, but the rubber is really just starting to hit the road with the Inflation Reduction Act dollars really starting to flow. Uh, the infrastructure bill of 2021, that those dollars are starting to flow. So you've got kind of fiscal spending that's going to continue to fuel decent growth. So I think that there is a kind of a broadening growth opportunity in the U.S. I think um, it's going to be not strong, but stable. Uh, I think we kind of have downward earnings revisions behind us. We're starting to see revisions tick up. And I think as you get you know, less fear about an imminent recession, you're going to get a broadening of the market. And that's going to provide a better opportunity set I'd say for non S and P type of investors, uh, whether it's the equal weighted S and P, you know, the mid cap, the small cap, the mid cap type benchmarks, I think it's there's a lot of concentration at the top, and it's time to think a little bit more broadly about where to place your bets. What you're saying then is that potentially the the consolidation of returns or the returns that have been generated by just a handful of companies in this country, S&P 500 or whatever, might start to spread around. And you're suggesting that maybe we don't go into a recession or a prolonged recession. Did I hear that correctly? Yeah, I think it's going to be slowing but stable growth. Um, and I, I don't think that we're going to imminently go into a recession. I think that just think about where we were six months ago, back in when Silicon Valley um, the crisis that hit the regional banking space or community banking space. Back in March, it was expected that the Fed was going to be cutting rates by September. Mm -hmm. uh, and here we are in September and the, next, and the rate cutting expectations are pushed out until May or June 24. So I think that just speaks to the resilience of, of kind of the U.S. economy. So the concern there that we talk about here in our office is the Fed is not done. We don't think the Fed is close to being done. We haven't, we haven't bought into that ever since it was kind of becoming common wisdom. I would say, do you feel like they're going to overshoot because inflation is kind of staying longer than most people anticipated? There's a lot of money in this economy, as we all know, tons of money was, was printed and flooded into the economy. So do you think that they can generate this in a soft landing or, or are we going to overshoot and then, potentially next year hit something that we didn't want? I think the forecasting mechanism of the Fed that hasn't been in existence in prior rate hiking cycles um, has really provided the opportunity to mitigate some of the damage. Um, that said, I think what matters more is really kind of how long the rates stay here as opposed to how much higher they go before they start cutting. If they raise rates and then have to start cutting quickly, I think that would kind of create a, a rapid mechanism of a correction. 
know, my greater fear is that rates stay up here for a prolonged period of time and we kind of run into that funding wall, right? Where there's lots of debt that's going to need to get refinanced um, over the next couple of years, especially in the commercial real estate space. And the longer that rates stay up here, um, the more of a reality that that's going to become is that low cost debt has to refi at current market rates. I was going to maybe jump in on that one, Billy, you know, just thinking about smaller and mid-sized companies. I mean, are, are you seeing this higher rate environment? Is that a challenge for these companies and how, how are they dealing with that? I mean, you're, a lot of times you're seeing these small companies that are higher leveraged companies. Is that something you guys are looking at when you're building or when you're looking at companies to go into your funds? I mean, absolutely. We're always thinking about financial leverage. You know, my, my general investment philosophy over the years have been, uh, there's tr three types of leverage. There's economic leverage, how sensitive are you to the top line? There's operating leverage, what's your fixed and variable cost structure? And then there's financial leverage. If you have all three at the wrong time, it can be the death knell, right? So I'm always thinking about financial leverage relative to what the business model is. I would say across the piece, whether it's small or SMID or mid cap for us, we are always have less financial leverage than the benchmark. Um, that's something we just strive for. But generally speaking, I don't think that leverage is necessarily a small cap, large cap or a SMID cap problem, if you will. Um, it really depends on where you sit in the economy. I think one of the fascinating things about this cycle is if you think about the way that different parts of the economy shut down during COVID um, and then reopened and the subsequent supply chain, you know, closing down and reopening, it's impacted different parts of the economy in vastly different manners and parts of the economy that are typically highly correlated. There's no better evidence than that if you think about consumer goods to services. We've all talked about the good to services transition um, very different cycles, right? Given the way the services economy took so long to reopen, but yet mm -hmm. both very tied to disposable income and consumer spending, and yet on vastly different cycles. So when I think about kind of where we are in the cycle and where leverage is going could impact you, it's very much a function of where you sit in that recovery. And I think, again, I think that's one of the fascinating things about the cycle we're in today is it's very disconnected. It's not nearly as Parts of the economy that have historically been very correlated are, are not correlated at all. Um, mm -hmm. We can invest in companies today where the supply chain is just opening you know, three years after COVID, two years after COVID. So I think that that's a great opportunity. And, you know, what the financial leverage looks like for one of those companies relative to another company, maybe in the goods space, that's already had the goods recovery. And frankly, they're dealing with inventory in the channel at this point of the cycle, while other supply chains are just reopening. I think that's what matters more. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense to us. And as far as the technology space, is it going to continue to lead or you mentioned that there's going to be maybe a dissemination of some of the market participation. Is that something you guys are forecasting in your portfolio? And if so, what are you guys doing recently and may, maybe making changes within yeah, those so, industries. Sure. So we take a very much a core approach to kind of how we build the portfolio. We don't try to be value. We don't try to be growth. I believe that over the cycle, you're better off not trying to pick a factor that's going to outperform through that cycle, which is why we sit in the core space, because we think we can find opportunities kind of on both ends of, of, of the distribution curve, so to speak. Uh, I generally think that there's a lot of concentration at the top. We're seeing it in the S&P, the top 10 names as a percentage of the weight in the S&P, I think, are through historical peaks that we saw in the first part of 21. Um, and to me, that's a warning flag. That's not where I want to go. Um, that's not where I think the best risk return is going to be for our investors. So I do think it's concentrated at the top. My general philosophy has been that markets – bottom on bad news and top on good news. And it's not lost on me that NVIDIA had another spectacular quarter in August. And the stock has, I believe, 10% lower than where it was you know, when it reported a week ago. Does that mean the tide is turning for tech? 
I don't know, but those are the types of things I look at um, to help me gauge where the best place is to allocate the incremental dollar. Uh, in terms of where the opportunities are for, for us in the portfolio and where I see them, again, I think it's broad based. There's areas in healthcare where we're just seeing the supply chain loosen, and that comes really in the form of labor and nurses. It's taken a while to bring those nurses back to work, given all the stress that they had to endure during COVID. Um, the great resignation, if you will, that we saw in that space. And as nurses are coming back, we're seeing some of our healthcare companies really start to be able to meet demand that they have not been able to meet. Um, and they're also seeing easing wage pressures um, on their P&L, which is a good thing for margins. You know, other areas, you know, we do think we do invest in the tech space. It's a big part of what we do, but we tend to be a little bit more picks and shovels. You know, we're not trying to pick the AI winner or loser as much as we are trying to pick that company that will help those companies become winners or losers and still have kind of a broad base of revenues, earnings, and cash flow coming from other areas. You know, we try to, you know, we take a risk adjusted approach to, to how we invest our, our investors' dollars. And for us, we want multiple ways to win. And so we try to find those companies maybe in the optical supply chain, right, that are going to be a beneficiary as as AI continues to penetrate every part of our lives and businesses, but that aren't necessarily entirely dependent on AI adoption to drive their revenue growth. I think it was yesterday that there was an announcement from an analyst, I believe at Morgan Stanley, who was talking about Tesla's new supercomputer program. I'm not sure exactly what it is. I'm not a techie, but I do know that he was projecting hundreds of billions of dollars in additional revenue from this, which is an AI learning type of a computer to advance the self-driving marketplace. So we're thinking self-driving taxis and all sorts of transportation vehicles of goods and services. And so when we're looking at Tesla, which is now accepting and moving um, into that AI space because it's understanding the capability. And I guess Musk is projected to spend a billion dollars on developing that system. Do you look at that as, as one of those companies that's figured it out and is kind of building on applications and not necessarily asking you your opinion of the stock or the stock price, but is that a company that's taking advantage of what the AI industry is really making available to all of us? Uh, I think Tesla and Tesla does not, not surprisingly, it doesn't fall into the smaller mid cap space. <laughs> not anymore. I've, cert I've certainly watched it over the years and, and been fascinated with it. I mean, I think Elon Musk has figured a lot out. Um, I think that Tesla is as much a software company as it is an auto auto manufacturer. I think that they, you know, a large part of what they do is collecting data, analyzing data and figuring out how to make their customers experience better. Um, Tesla, like many companies is, is exploring and evaluating, you know, how they can use AI to improve the experience. Um, Tesla has a significant amount of dollars that they can throw at that um, in, in that discovery process. And I trust that in, investors are not going to penalize them for that immediately and investors aren't going to be demanding what the understanding what the ROI is on those investments. But I do think that we are in kind of proof of concept. Um, I think that, you know, initially AI is going to be used, and this is probably an appropriate analogy given that we're talking about Tesla as a co-pilot. It's not going to be replacing people or functionality um, right now. But Tesla's got a big multiple, lots of money, and they can play the long game. Um, and they have been, and it's paid off for them. So I suspect if anyone's going to be able to figure it out, I wouldn't bet against Elon Musk. Some people are predicting that this is going to be just shake up to the entire world. And I would like maybe your thoughts to put it into perspective for our listeners, because most of us don't even know some of these concepts or what AI even does or what, it, what it's intended to do. So that's my question for you is can you can you dummy that down a little bit and tell us what 
AI is really intended to do and maybe some of the applications that we might see? Sure. Um, it's always tricky, right, when you get into the use case. So I think it's, I mean, if you think about AI, it's already really being used for recommendation engines based on prior behavior, um, more around consumer preferences. Uh, as you kind of think about what gener generative AI is going to do, it's really going to penetrate our lives through customer services, writing content, um, really improving efficiency. Um, that's the beginning. You know, as you look out five, it's, it's really hard to try to put it in a bottle when you look out kind of over the next five years. I don't believe that, that this is about um, reducing the workforce. I mean, there's too much risk initially uh, because the quality of the output is a little bit unknown, right? I think that we're all, a lot of companies, and we talk to a lot of companies that are making investments, thinking about how to reprioritize their investments to understand what the opportunity is. But again, I think it's too much risk in the near term until the output um, has really been validated, especially when you think about a Tesla type situation, right? That's why we, our view is that it's really gonna be like a lot of new technologies getting adopted, be running in the co-pilot seat, right? As opposed to, to driving the bus, so to speak. Um, but I don't think that it's gonna lead to this you know, great, kind of um, workforce elimination redundancy. I think it's going to be about reallocation of people, um, reskilling people, reskilling the workforce to higher value added areas. Um, I don't think it's going to lead to unemployment lines wrapping around the block because companies or people were displaced by, by AI type tools. Excuse me, we're almost in the home stretch for the episode. But before we cross the finish line, I just want you to know that you can contact Billy and his team at www.petersonws.com or by visiting the show notes. Now, back to harnessing your wealth. What about the the concept there of uh, just people having uh, the idea that AI is is a new concept that we're really not familiar with? And it, will it create more jobs such as the Internet did? It, it displaced a few things, got more efficiencies, but new jobs were created. And can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that question? Yeah. I mean, again, I still think we're in proof of concept and we're in the data accumulation mode, if you will, which is just massive in scales. And models are really just beginning to get trained on how to use that data and extrapolate that data. Um you know, do I think that it's going to create jobs or eliminate jobs? I, I, it's too early to tell. I mean, there's a massive build out of infrastructure. If you think about the picks and shovels to support the amount of data and storage required around leveraging some of these AI tools. And I, I do think that those that is going to create kind of lots of opportunity for companies supporting that growth and supporting that implementation. Um, and I do think that that will drive employment, whether or not that's a short term or longer term trend. I think it's it's really too early to tell. Um, but it's hard, right? The market likes to the market likes to to take long term trends and discount them today, right? The market, what we saw back in May of of this year with that you know really stunning Nvidia report at the end of May was the market tried to pick the winners and losers day one. And invariably, the market's going to get some right and probably a lot wrong. Um, and ultimately, water's going to have to find its level. Um, so for us, it's, it's interesting to kind of see early kind of where the market's picking the winners and where they're deeming losers. Um, I think there's probably more opportunity to, to fish around the area where the market is deemed losers um, over the long term, because invariably, I think they may be a little bit quick to react. You know, we've seen some of these companies that were down 30% in May, just as a random report was written that they were going to be an AI loser. <laughs> um, and we think that, you know, we can show you evidence in every technology transition that's occurred, these companies end up being winners in the IT services space, for instance. Um, <laughs> So I do think there's lots of opportunity there, and, and, and that's how we try to think about capitalizing on it. 
other industries that you guys look at, do you have any feelings toward industries like real estate, energy, more the commodity type businesses? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, real estate's such a catch-all, right? I mean, there's parts of real estate that are doing exceptionally well. You can look at um, the single-family rental home REITs, uh, which we own a couple of that are doing phenomenally well. And then there's other areas, Class B office that is structurally challenged um, and probably will remain so. Now, I've always, um, I think real estate as an asset class is, is fantastic. I don't love the way we have to invest in it. In the U.S. through the REIT structure, those mm -hmm. companies are constantly redistributing their cash. Um, having to come back to the public markets to fund growth. That's not a model in my mind that compounds over time. But I think we're in a pretty interesting spot with some REITs um, and it's early and we really haven't, um, I wouldn't say we've crossed the finish line on any of these, but they have the opportunity because their taxable income is going to be so low to be a little bit more creative with their cash flow than just um, you know, giving it back to investors in the form of dividends. And we've seen some, some large REITs who have basically told us we're going to cut our dividend and we're going to keep our cash. And you may even see us buy back stock, which is not something REITs do quite, quite a bit. Challenge in the REIT space is that we need assets to trade in the private hands so we can kind of set the NAVs for those public companies. And we're just starting to see some of those um, commercial office in particular start to trade that will help set the floor. I think there's going to be a tremendous kind of opportunity there. It's going to take time. You know, the initial opportunity is going to be um, kind of the solvency trade, which is you realize these companies are still going to remain in business. And then it's going to be a cost of capital discussion in terms of what's the cost of capital required to continue to fund their business and grow. Um, housing in general, I don't I think is a very interesting area. I don't think that we we're nowhere near, we're, we're not going to have the housing crisis we had in 07 and 08. 90% of mortgages are fixed. As rates rise, there's no resets that are going to force sellers. Um, we have another issue in real estate, which is affordable housing, and we don't have many much starter home or single family home availability. Um, and it's going to keep people in their homes longer. And I think one of the areas that one of the trends that we see is that people are going, they have lots of positive equity. They have low cost, they have a low cost mortgage to the extent that their homestead needs change. They're going to meet those changing needs through repair and remodel investment because they have positive equity and they don't want to reset their mortgage at current rates as opposed to lift and shift, right? Which is what we'd see in prior cycles when the cost of financing or mortgage rates were lower. Um, so we think there's an interesting opportunity in the repair and remodel space. Um, energy, you know, it's, that's a challenging spot. Um, it's not a huge percentage of our benchmark. We're slightly underweight energy. And frankly, it's, it's been the wrong, we've been a little bit on the wrong side over the past month or so. Uh, there's some structural challenges and, and we've been pleasantly surprised um, with the supply discipline that we've seen from the energy patch. Um, over the past cycle, really, not just this year, but when prices were high a couple of years ago, you saw the, the suppliers be very disciplined on growing capacity, um, which is interesting because there's so much of the domestic supply is, is in the hands of, of private companies, um, and yet they remain very disciplined. So, you know, we look across all areas of the market to find where, the, where we think the best and most misunderstood opportunities lie. Um, I wouldn't tell you we have that view in energy at the moment. Uh, I still think that while the domestic growth has been resilient, there are challenges in China, in Europe. The oil is a global commodity. Um, so it's, it's hard for us to, to be too constructive right now on the energy space. And it, as far as the fixed income landscape, I know you're, you're not really a portfolio manager in fixed income, but your thoughts on rates says you think maybe I heard you say earlier that going into next year, and then we may start seeing the Fed begin cutting. Is that the consensus there at your firm? I think rates are, you know, what matters to us, frankly, for our companies is cost of capital. And cost of capital is rising, and it's changing the way companies are, are prioritized in capital allocation. You know, we are seeing um, 
we're seeing much more uh, thoughtful allocation of incremental dollars. We're not seeing, you know, these this mentality of taking on debt to fund growth, the questionable returns. We're seeing companies that um, did have negative earnings or negative cash flow that were spending aggressively to grow. We are seeing them think about profitability because cost of capital is rising and they don't want to have to come back to the capital markets. Yeah. Um, Last time we had in a late cycle, we saw maybe a lot of, maybe more so, maybe it's just my my view of the world, but more in the form of consolidation, mergers and acquisitions. Are you seeing any of that in your day-to-day work? I'll say a couple of things about that. I think private equity has been on the sidelines as, as rates have gone up. It's very hard to justify um you know, putting that amount of leverage on the on on companies, which which private equity needs to get their return on their equity and their IRR. Uh, we are seeing a lot of strategic deals. Um, we've it, interestingly a lot of those try to get done with stock, stock for stock deal, and they turn out to be at no premium because the acquirer stock collapses, and the acquiree stock goes up for a blink of an eye until you do the ratio analysis and realize it was a no premium deal. So we are seeing some consolidation. A good example of that today, it's a smaller deal, but uh, West Rock paper and packaging was taken out by Smurfit. You know, it was an announced premium of 15, 18%, I think pre, pre-market. Uh, I think West Rock is down today. So I would say don't look for um the m a market to bail you out in a rising rate environment like we're seeing. The one caveat I will mention is that we have seen a, a lot of IPOs, you know, the, the, the calendar, the IPO calendar is stacking up again. And there's a number of large IPOs that are, that are scheduled this month. Um, Arm Holdings, chip design company, huge deal, only selling a small amount of stock, structuring that deal to work in the public markets. Um, Instacart doing the same thing, you know, 10 billion market cap company. I think they're floating three or $400 million of equity again, structuring it to kind of work in the market so they can come back at a later date. Birkenstock, there's a number of IPOs that are on the calendar. I would argue if you see those, you know, private equity find their exits through the public market, um, you might see animal spirits kind of reinvigorate a little bit, right? They need to get out of some of their existing investments before they can reallocate those, those dollars. So um, I'm very intrigued to see how the market absorbs those new issues coming um, over the, over the next month. Guys, I've been quiet a little bit this whole podcast, but Bob, am I going to have a chip in me at some point with all this (laughs) AI stuff going on? No, but that doesn't mean you can't put one in your kids. Well, oh, that, boy. yeah, that's good. He needs one. Yeah. yeah, I need a. I've got twins, Bob, and I. I would like love some chips for those. So. <laughs> They're yeah. making us put chips in horses now. Did you guys know that? It's called Lip I, Chip. It's a I company. Knew that. It's a for real legit company, Lip Chip. So yeah, it's it's happening. It's a trend in animals. You can put them in your dogs. Dogs kind of too. Later. I actually, yeah. this is no lie. I was talking to my wife about this the other day and she's like, oh, well, there's a girl on Instagram and yeah, she is, she's chipped. She's our neighbor. She lives by us. And she's got this huge following where she's scanning her card with her chip. Like, you know, she's Apple pay in her hand guys. So <laughs> I, it's terrifying yeah. to me. I'm not going to allow that to happen to myself, but you know, a lot of people will. Uh, I don't could... know why they. I don't know why they need to put one in you when you probably have three devices on you at all times oh, yeah. that yeah. can track you. Yeah, seriously, yeah. it's wild. You steal your phone, or they could just cut off one of your hands. I mean, it's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, use it for the same purpose. Maybe more, Billy. We're about up on time, I believe. But just you know, one thing I when we're looking at these AI companies or tech companies, however you want to categorize them, but valuations seem to be stretched um massively in some cases do these companies are they going to grow into that i mean what's what's the end game for that on on some of them it's going to take a long time i've been i mean yeah. if i if you were to ask me my my one my biggest surprise of this year it's that as as rates have continued to increase 
the long duration equities, which are the ones with the highest multiples, have been the best performers. Real rates at 2% are usually, as real rates rise, multiples compress. And yet we've seen the companies with the highest multiples be the best performers. Like that's the great disconnect for me in, mm -hmm. in 2023. I don't, I use history as my guide. That's not sustainable over time. I've, I've lived this cycle before. Um, maybe not the exact cycle, but you know, history may not repeat, but it rhymes. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, I've seen kind of how this plays out. And my, you know, the, the philosophy I apply when investing is you're always going to make mistakes. Just don't make them at extremes. And I think to rush in and buy the things that are, have outperformed year to date were at such extremes, I think that it would be a tremendous mistake. And again, I'd go back and just look at kind of the returns of the equal weight S&P versus the market cap weight. You haven't seen this type of spread since 98 and 99. And over the next four years, that unwound and then some. Um, so yeah. it's always hard to identify the catalyst. But again, like when I think about how to increment, allocate the incremental dollar for our investors, you know, I want to think about where my best risk reward opportunity is. Value and matters. I, Going back to that whole one. The long run value technology. matters. Mm-hmm. That's one of the ways we're looking at things. I mean, momentum, momentum has a place at some points in time and different cycles, but just like a runaway freight train, gravity will slow it down eventually. And so we're watching all of those things in the market, how things are shaping up, allocating, reallocating, diversifying, rebalancing, lots going into it. And one of the reasons we really like Hartford and Hartford Schroeder's is the great minds like yours who provide context and do the hard work on a regular basis for their investors. And we know that we've had a great partnership with you guys for many, many years, including working with our internal partner here, the wholesaler who external wholesaler, Matt Montague, who's been a great ally and advocate for us and a lot of the things that we do here for our clients. So Thank you for your time today, Bob. Some great insights into what's going on in the world and, and the marketplaces and different industries and sectors and what's going to happen maybe in technology and AI over the next five to 10 years. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me. You're Good welcome. to meet you, Bob. Thank you. Great to meet you, Sean. Thanks, Billy. You bet. Everybody out there, thanks for listening to us today. We hope you enjoyed the show. And until next time, hang on out there. Don't get bucked off. Thank you for listening to Harnessing Your Wealth with Billy Peterson. Before we declare the race official, please click the follow button so you can be notified when new episodes become available. For more information about today's show, please check out the show notes. Visit our website at www.petersonws.com or give us a call at 801-475-4002. Once again, thank you for listening. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Peterson Wealth Services. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.